I wanted to talk to you today about evolving with the threats and what we're seeing out there and that you know we, we keep adding more and more technology to our daily lives. It's become an intricate part of everyone's life. Uh, everyone's got several devices at home. We connect our electricity, we connect our housewarming. Um, pretty much everything that has a computer, we connect to the cloud. And we, we do that because we, we live in a giant life hack. You know, we want to make everything easier. We want to simplify our daily lives, and we use internet and computers to do that. Uh, let's see. Okay, having some technical difficulties here. <laughs> Maybe that was uh, this thing. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. So um, if we look at the, the evolution of IoT and where we are at the moment, we can see that you know, we, we pretty much came from uh, nothing. And where we are today, everything is connected. Everything's got a computer. So I wanted to focus on the early 2000s when everything became universal. You know, everything was connected to the internet. You got your mail. Uh, everyone's got their hot mail. You had American Online, uh, Yahoo. Uh, and you know, we had all this instant messaging. Everything just became, we, Y2K was a thing. Uh, we went online and even our grandmas and grandpas had a computer and were able to communicate on the internet. It was, it was a global thing. And from there, it just escalated. Uh, everything went from zero to 100 in a matter of a couple of years. And where we are at the moment, as you can imagine, everything, you know, cars, you have refrigerators that are you know, equipped with Wi-Fi, so you can order your food directly from the refrigerator. Um, and this, of course, you know, poses a problem, because are we really ready to just put everything out in the cloud? Are we, are we ready for having everything exposed, our homes, our businesses, everything. You know, we have to think about the implications of putting everything up on the internet. And of course, we're not the only ones that are uh, using or abusing technology to further their own gains. If we look at, for example, the other side of the fence, the bad guys or the hackers, they also use technology to gain money, further their own gains, to evolve themselves, so to speak. So we need to stay one step ahead of them and evolve even further. So if we look at malware, for example, and how they have followed the trends, we can see that uh, we have, for example, the Melissa virus, which started in 1998. And that was a mail-based virus. It was a phishing campaign. And around that time, 1998, we could see that you know everyone had an email account, and everyone was online, and everyone was communicating using email. So naturally, uh, the hackers and all the attackers started using mail to send out phishing mails. So they sent, they sent out phishing mails, fooling people to open it. And it was, of course, the Melissa virus, which caused 1.2 billion in damages around the world. And from there, they, they keep, kept following the trend. You know, Love Letter, that was also a phishing campaign, probably loosely based on the film You Got Mail with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, if, if anyone's seen that one. Uh, again, they keep following the trends, they keep looking at pop culture, what are we doing, what are we humans doing, um, and just basically doing exactly what's right at the time to hit our emotional you know, trigger points, to find out you know, what are we reacting on, what are we opening, what mails are we looking at, etc. And uh, in 2007, pretty much all banks you know, started using online uh, banking portals for all their customers. So it was pretty hard back then to, you know, find a bank office that would take your, um, your, you know, cases because everything was online these days. You know, you had your app in your phone, you had your computer and your little box that you could log in with. So everything was done online. And of course, again, the hackers started abusing that as well. So they released the SUS Trojan, which, which basically uh, was built as a rootkit to steal money uh, when you were doing your bank errands online. So it was basically in the background and logging everything you did and redirecting the money to somewhere else. And if you were lucky, your bank would cut on and see that there was something suspicious in your account and they would block the access to your account and give you a call and say, okay, there's something wrong with your account. You have malware on your computer. But if you were unlucky, 
and the bank didn't have those kind of uh, security practices in place, then you would, of course, lose money. <clears throat> and moving on, we could see that uh, this is where the game changed, because this is where you could go online and you could buy uh, a package that you could yourself distribute, and you could basically uh, implement your own ransomware, imp implement your own cryptoware, and send it out in the world, and it will be concealed within a package that was basically hacking the machines for you and doing all the dirty work. You just got the payload and you got the money in the end. But this is also where we started to react. You know, the business changed and we started using machine learning and we started using uh, big data in the cloud to uh, basically combat all the vari varieties of malware that was released out into the world because that was uh, by then, it started to escalate really quickly, so it was like several hundred thousands uh, different kind of malware that was, you know, deployed actively in the wild at all times. And of course, leading up to the Locky ransomware, which we all probably have heard about by now. Um, and um, yeah, that's where we are at the moment, you know, ransomware has become a thing of the future and this is how they make money you know they steal your data and they lock it away or encrypt it and you know they demand money you know you have to pay up if you want to get your data back so what have we done uh, we of course have tried to follow you know in this uh, cat and mouse game uh, we're also developing technologies to prevent the attacks and also to try and stop them when they actually occur um, so we added different techniques. We also added next generation protection in form of runtime protection and exploit detection. But we also realized that we need to stay one step ahead all the time. And this is reactive protection. This is something that occurs when you are about to get infected or if you have been infected, then these protections kick in. All right. So what we did, we developed synchronized security. And synchronized security is uh, pretty much a way of creating a system, a system of all your protections where they talk to each other, they exchange data and they work together creating m multiple layers to protect you from all the different kind of malware out there, phishing mail, uh, bad network traffic, etc. Um, <clears throat> so we have, our, uh, we have our synchronized security, we have our system in place, but is that really enough? You know, do we, are we secure now? Do we have everything we need? No, of course not, because we need something in the background to automate everything. You know, we need someone to, uh, when, our, when us humans are sleeping or, you know, when we are away, we need someone to take care of all the bad malware automatically. So we started looking at machine learning and um, machine learning is uh, all around us. You know, we, we have it in our cars, we have it in, Google, for example. Uh, we have it in our phones, predictive apps, for example, and we have it in search engines. Everything is based on machine learning these days. So th this is nothing new. You know, everything uses machine learning. And if you look at machine learning, um, this requires, for example, pretty serious algorithms to, you know, differentiate. If you look at the dog, for example, and the mop, uh, imagine the algorithms it would take to actually differentiate the mob from the dog. You know, even with, with the human eye, this is still pretty hard, you know, as you can see. But you see a tongue there, you see a nose, you know, you can, you can see that there, there's a dog there somewhere, even though it's hard to see. And if we look at the other picture of the parrot and guacamole, for example, then it becomes even harder. You know, dif try to, using a machine, differentiate from guacamole and parrots, for example. That's pretty, that's pretty serious coding right there. And um, you may think that machine learning is magic, but it's not, it's built by humans. You know, from the beginning, we add our algorithms, we add our um, sets of rules. For example, if you see a picture of a cat, that's a cat, it's got ears, it's got a tail, it's got fur, and everything like that. Um, so the machines we have at the moment, they are built by humans, they are coded by humans, and they are taught by humans, okay? And the same goes for malware, for example. If we look at a uh, good program, you know, it's a good program, it's got its set of uh, rules, 
And a bad program is, of course, a malware. And that's exactly what the machine sees as well. You know, we have coded it to look at bad programs as malware and good programs as goodware. Okay, basic stuff. So what's the next step? Of course, we needed to develop machine learning even further. So we came up with machine learning and uh, deep learning. Deep learning is, is basically uh, creating a human mind uh, from a computer. So instead of us having to teach it things, it will teach itself and it will add context to what it is seeing. So instead of looking just at the mop, for example, and the dog, it will start to differentiate and see, okay, does it have a tail? Does it have ears? Does it have fangs? Does it have paws? And eventually it will start to teach itself and add these contact rules to its own neurological pattern. And this is why this is so important because machine learning can only do so much based on what we teach it. But in order to really progress, we need to have something that teaches itself. And this is why we have deep learning. So what am I missing? I, I talked about machine learning, I talked about deep learning, ransomware, malware, and everything like that. But the biggest threat, as I see it, is this guy. And this guy, he's not interested in your, you know, small pictures on your computer or your baby pictures or whatever. He's after something else. And that something else is what's important to us, you know, the information. Information is gold these days. The data you have in your offices is your gold and you need to protect it. And what this guy does, he uses advanced threats to gain access to your networks. Um, so if you look at ransomware, okay, you know, your files are encrypted, give me your money, that's it, okay? End of story. But imagine if someone was watching what you were doing or stealing your data. That would be something more serious. You know, that would be, um, you know, that, that, that's the worst thing that can happen. You know, your integrity, your data, that, that's you. You don't want that to end up in someone else's hands. And if you look at history, for example, um, for example, Sony, they were also hit by a, a um, hacker attack like that. Uh, Yahoo, and of course, if we move in further up in time, there's been some other events similar to that one where they've used an advanced threat to gain access to the network and also steal data and exfiltrate it to the cloud. So advanced threats are basically, uh, you know, you have your entry points. It could be a phishing mail. It could be uh, locally on a computer, USB stick. And um, as soon as you're in the computer, it calls home to a command and control server. And that's where the hackers gain access to your network. Then they're able to covertly spread in the network and silently exfiltrate data. And this is called lateral movement. So they're able to, once they're in, move around freely in your network and steal your data. So this is actually something that we've seen uh, relatively often in the past. For example, last year, um, we had a huge wave of RDP servers being hacked. So basically, what people did, they put their RDP servers publicly on the internet. So you could access it using a normal RDP client. Um, and instead of being smart and actually you know, protecting it behind a firewall with a VPN client, they just put it out on the internet because it's cheap and you don't have to educate your users. I mean, it's hard to use a VPN client, right? You know, it's really advanced stuff. And you don't want to teach your users that because that takes time, it costs money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what happened was that, you know, all these servers were hacked all around the globe and they were uh, consequent, consequently sold on the black market for $5 a piece. So you could buy a hacked RDP server for $5 that you could do whatever you want with. And no one knew what was behind the RDP server. It could be anyone's company or, you know, whatever. So basically, you sold the RDP servers and they could use it for whatever. Bitcoin mining, they could exfiltrate data or whatever. No one knew. So that's the, that's the real threat as I see it. Um, hackers gaining access to your network and that's where we see that we need to evolve even further in order to um, create protections that also protects us from hackers that gains access to your network. And in the uh, next generation protections that we are offering at the moment, we have 
protections against these lateral movements or hacker attacks. So we will be able to block them even though they're inside your network. But uh, there's something else uh, that doesn't require technology, that doesn't require anything except for your wits or your smarts or the ability to push on someone's emotional triggers. And that is social engineering, uh, which is still one of the biggest threats. The handsome man you see is actually Kevin Mitnick. He was uh, charged with several accounts of hacking back in 1998, I think. Uh, pretty famous hacker, and the, the main tool in his arsenal was actually social engineering, and he was really proud of that because he he managed to he managed managed to push on emotion and you know your intellectual uh, self to gain access to, for example, passwords or you know bank accounts or whatever. So that was his trick, and this is still being used today uh, to gain access to networks, to gain access to uh, buildings or whatever, or Simply everything. You can use social engineering for so much. Um, and that is what makes it so dangerous, that it's still used and it's the oldest, tri oldest trick in the book, um, and it doesn't require anything. And it, like our gentleman here, Kevin, says, it can ba bypass all technologies and all firewalls. And this happens all the time. You know, you could either be blackmailed to, you know, let me into your network or simply just you know ask for the password you know, it could be that simple and if someone wants to get into your network they will get into, get into your network so you need to be able to protect yourself even on the human plane okay so you need to educate your users um, so how do you educate your users I mean it's so it takes a lot of resources takes a lot of time but when it comes to something so easy as phishing mails for example there are great tools out there for example we have something called fish threat which will enable you to continuously educate your users using phishing campaigns and also training campaigns so they will learn on a weekly basis maybe or a monthly basis what to do with their passwords what to do with phishing mails etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not about only technology these days, you also need to think about your users. You need to evolve with technology, you need to let your users evolve as well, and you need to really think about the human aspects of what we're act actually seeing out there. And the, uh, a human in your network is probably more dangerous than a malware in your network in most cases. Could be that simple. Um, that's actually it for me, guys. So if you have any questions, just shoot.